Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me again on another episode of Powerhouse U. Today, I am accompanied by Daryl Murphy Sr. Daryl Murphy is with Murphy Baynard Group, and what they do is uh, syndications. And then uh, I'm going to let you guys know what the definition of a syndication is, which will actually give you a little bit of insight on what Daryl does. And then we're going to go to a Q&A session after that and also let you uh, Daryl give his introduction. So uh, basically taking from uh, the Forbes.com, a, a real estate syndication is when a group of investors pull money together, uh, their capital to jointly purchase a large real estate property that could be apartments, mobile home parks, land, self-storage units, and other real estate assets where some investment opportunities are available through real estate syndication. And then that's basically by definition, what Daryl Murphy does, and I'll let him give you a little bit more specifics about what that is and how you guys could join. Sounds good. A syndication, well, it, really, the, the the whole conversation is what you read. It is a pool of investors, right? Who are you, but there's all, huh? Oh, <laughs> I didn't even introduce myself. Who so, are you? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm Daryl Murphy, uh, Daryl Murphy Sr. with the Murphy Bain and Financial Group. And what we do, we, we do syndications. We acquire these large assets, commercial multifamily, apartment buildings, and we ask other people who would like to pool their money with us. I like the way you put that too. Thank you. <laughs> you're, you're very welcome. You're getting straight to it. <laughs> yeah. I respect that. <laughs> All right. So that's what it is. So what is your, what's your title with uh, Murphy Baynard? Um, I'm the managing manager. Manning. for the Murphy Bain and Financial Group, yeah. Okay, all right, and then, okay, so syndications, and mm -hmm. what I read was pretty much on point, so yeah, feel free to elaborate uh, on this point, at this point about okay. what you do. Okay, so so what I do, um, I, I acquire assets, and then I go to a syndication attorney, we form a, a, a syndication, and it's either gonna be a 506B, which is a, an accredited for non-accredited or 506C, which is for accredited. And so um, the, the United States definition for to, what to be a, an accredited investor, is you can find it in the SEC rule 501, and that's in the Reg D where you can find that, okay? But to be an accredited investor, a person must have an annual income exceeding $200,000, right? Mm -hmm. Or if, if it's a husband and wife, $300,000 for joint income, right? Mm -hmm. And it must be for the, for the last two years with the expectation of earning the same or higher income in the current year, right? So an individual must have earned income above the threshold, either alone or with a spouse over the last two years. Now, a person... So it's to be an also, accredited, oh, right. so in order to be an accredited investor, you actually have to meet a financial threshold. Correct, uh, and that's going to be the difference between accredited and non-accredited. Non correct, and there's and a person is also considered an accredited investor if they have a net worth exceeding one million dollars, either individually mm -hmm. or jointly with your spouse. Okay. Okay. So, the, um, so the SEC also considers a person to be an accredited investor if they are a general partner, executive officer, or director for the company that is issuing the security. So, okay. So SEC is stands for Security Exchange Commission. Security Exchange Commission. So, and then two to be accredited, you have to meet a, a minimum threshold. And then did you say right. or a dollar amount for the assets of 1.5? The, the, uh, the you must have a net worth exceeding a million dollars. Okay, so okay, is that and so you have to have the the two hundred and fifty thousand dollar income and have a net worth of one million? 
No, it could be either or. Either or. Okay. So either or, or you could be a GP in an investment group? Correct. Okay. Or one now, of the other titles? Right. Now, so to make it simple, mm -hmm. if let's just say you were to go out. Now, let's assume you are a non-accredited investor, right? Okay. You go out, you get your deal, you make it a 506C, which is open to accredited investors but you are the GP on that deal, right? The general so, partner. There you go. Uh -huh. Your general partner considers, sorry, considers an accredited investor uh -huh. if they are a GP and you are a GP. So you, for that deal, you'd be considered an accredited investor. Okay. So, okay. So that's what an accredited investor is. What is a non-accredited investor? So a non-accredited investor just doesn't meet the requirements. That's all. But you could still invest even though you don't meet the requirements. Uh, yes, so, you can. all right. So, if you're a non accredited investor and you don't meet the requirements, you could put in a minimum amount into a deal. Yes, mm -hmm. you can. So, and go ahead. That would be an, a non accredited investor can invest in a 506B raise because 506B raises are open to accredited mm -hmm. and non-accredited so what's the difference between the two the accredited and non-accredited yeah. right so, so that, and that's the difference in the codes too is accredited and not accredited yeah so the 506c is for accredited only mm -hmm. right but the difference between the two a 506c you can advertise i could come on your show right here and i can advertise if it's a 506c Mm -hmm. If it's a 506 B, I cannot advertise publicly on your show or any social media. And why is that? Because due to the fact of the sophistication mm -hmm. of of uh, uh, of investing. So, in order for a person to in uh, in order for a non accredited investor to credit to invest in my investment, if I had a you know if it was a 506 B. I must have had a prior relationship with that person. Or let's say you and I are partners. Mm -hmm. They're working together on the deal. The person doesn't know me, but they know you. They can invest. As long as they know someone, as long as they know either me, you, or one of our affiliates, they can invest in the deal. So you can advertise the deal word to mouth, but you can't advertise it publicly on a on a public platform. Yes, but it, it should be to a person that you already had a prior a relationship, relationship with. with. Okay, and then you said that's due to the complex nature of the deal. Yeah, because um, a lot of times when you're dealing with non sophisticated investors, you know there may be some things they don't understand. The uh -huh. way the, the way the SEC looks at it is if you're an accredited investor and you're bringing in over 200,000 or, or you have over a million dollars in assets, uh, you know, th there's other questions that they do ask, like if you've invested before, stuff like that, right? But mm -hmm. if the way they look at it is you understand the risk that you're taking mm -hmm. for an accredited investor. A non-accredited investor, they, you, they don't understand, they may not understand the risk that they're taking. So with non-accredited investors, you, you must make sure that you educate them to the deal, make sure that they understand what they're getting into and stuff like that. Okay. If, so, if you see a person isn't, you know, if you see a, um, if you see a person really don't understand what they're doing, if I was you, I wouldn't take their money. Right. Okay. So I think I'm kind of putting it together because when you bring in other people on the deal, does that automatically make you a GP because these people have to answer to you on the deal? No, it don't automatically make you a GP. No, okay, because uh, you could come in on a deal as a limited partner, uh -huh. and LP and GP means LP limited partner, GP general partner, and then a the GP, limited partner. A, a GP has an active role. We actually putting in the work, you know, executing the plan, finding the property, doing the work, and the, and the limited partner is a passive investor. We, they they lend you the money so you could get the job done and, and, and stuff like that. And they, and you pay them interest on your money, you know, dividends and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. 
So that's what that's a, a passive investor. They don't want that active role. They don't want to be dealing with the property manager. They don't want to be dealing with trying to go out here and find deals. They don't want to have to deal with that. But they give you the money so you go deal with that. Right. You know? Yeah. And you bring back the return, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So um, I don't think we discussed it yet, but your, uh, your specialty when it comes to syndication is multifamily. And then right. Uh, right now you're working on a multifamily deal right now and then uh, pulling in money for that. Now, if you can't speak on that one publicly, which one can you speak on to where we could talk about how you guys handle people that are coming with uh, the bare minimum amount of money? In addition to uh, you and I discussed prior to that, there is also a possibility of somebody creating an LLC in order to come in on a syndication deal. So can we talk about talk about that? Of course we can. And and when it, you know the Dayton property is a five hundred six B. No, I cannot advertise and tell you like the returns and this that and the other. Mm-hmm. And you know my attorneys say don't say nothing. <laughs> right. Uh-huh. So um, if anyone wants to know more, this is what I can say. If okay. anyone wants to know more about the Dayton deal, and you may be interested reach out to me and, mm-hmm. and you know, that's what that's what we are, are saying. When mm-hmm. it comes to other deals that is a 506C, man, I will post, I will post the 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 returns and everything, right? IRR 19 plus, uh equity multiple two plus, um the um uh the average cash on cash eight plus, right? And uh-huh. we could and we could we could share that. So of course of us being open to accredited investors, right? Mm-hmm. Now, let's get into what you did, what you said about the forming for passive investors. I'm going to say for passive investors. Okay. <clears throat> Those that want to get in on it. Let's say, you know, you want to get in on a deal, right? So, but you don't have the 10000 right? You and I, we know each other. We have history. You can invest with me no matter what, whether it's a credit or credit. I mean, whether it's a credit or if it's a five or six B, you can invest with me because we know each other. Mm-hmm. But let's say you say, "Damn, I don't have the fifty thousand." Say, okay, what you can do, you know, you you know, what you can do is say, okay, my mom wants to invest. She got ten. I got ten. My aunt got 10, my uncle got 10, and my cousin got 10. That's 50,000. So you get with them and you say to them, you know, listen, are y'all interested in investing in this deal? And, you know, you, you give them the the investor's packet and they're looking it over. They're like, yo, I like these, uh, you know, I like these numbers. These are good. Yeah, let's invest as as a as a as a group. Mm-hmm. So that way it could be fifty thousand, and so what you could do is start an LLC, and all of your members of the LLC, and then you can invest in the deal. So you, you could all pull your money together, yeah. Create an LLC, put money into right. the deal, right? And, <clears throat> and, and 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 what is the and what is that called when you pull when people pull their money together? What what's the definition? I want to say syndication. Am I right? Syndication. There you go. <laughs> I'm right. <laughs> a syndication is nothing but when people pool their money together to acquire an asset. Yeah. So you could create an LLC within your own entity or a group, and then you guys just bring your pot to the syndication to you guys. Yes. So when yes. you do it like that, how does that work different than doing it as an individual? Now remember, you didn't have the 50 grand. Right. No, I'm I'm saying comparing two people. So comparing a person that does in fact have the 50, 50 grand and they put their right. money in the deal versus yeah. an LLC that had to pull their money together. Now, mm-hmm. what do the returns usually look like on, on deals like that? Is there really a difference between how you guys split the funds on a on a syndication mm-hmm. deal? Remember, <clears throat> it's not it's not you, the people that's investing. Mm-hmm. It's the LLC that's investing. Right. So the returns that's that's that uh, the projections that's in your investor's packet, mm-hmm. when that goes to when that K one is cut or when that distribution, uh, when that dividend is cut, 
-hmm. and it's going to be made out to the LLC. So you guys determine how you split that, the payments. Within the, correct. Within the so LLC. Within the, yeah, within the LLC. Now, if if each of you give an equal amount, I would think that you would split that equally. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. 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 Okay. And then, so on a typical syndication, what's the usual timeline from the time that you raise the funds, um, purchase the property, and the whole time? And what? Uh, how does the process usually go? Like, if I was a client, and then I put my my money in the deal, where? Do, how does it go from beginning to end? Okay. So, uh, the whole time you usually could run anywhere from three, five, seven years, ten years, right? Mm -hmm. It really, it depends on, it depends on the sponsor, you know, how they structure the investment, the investment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Whether it's three years, five years, seven years, 10 years. Um, and that's the, that could be the whole time. When it comes to distributions, right? Distributions can be done. However, that is also structured. Whether it's one month, uh, whether it's every month, every quarter, every year it depends on how they structure it it also depends on the deal right you get into a deal that's a that's a ground up or, or let's say a vacant building there's not going to be any distributions whatsoever until that money starts rolling in right so so the the, the distribution structure you know the, the, that that could be done depending on the team how they have a structure you may get a dividend every single month you may get one every quarter you may get one every year but you will get dividends on your cash okay so is it safe to say that when you put money into a syndication it kind of works like a like the stock market and whatever your investment in on that is what your percentage return is going to be. So if you invest $10 and in, uh, I don't know, you got 10 people, look, now my math is off. So you just get your, <laughs> you just get your return based on whatever percentage you put into the company. And that's how your check is going to be cut. Like on, and on, on div, like for example, me personally, I have a cash app account and then I put money into a stock and every month my uh, cash app gives me a dividend, even though it's only like a couple cents. So if you only put a couple, um, a couple hundred dollars into the deal, which I know you can't, but just hypothetically speaking, if you did, you'll only be getting that quarterback or so like I get from the stock that I, that I did. And that's pretty much how it works in a syndication. So <clears throat> comparing it to the to the stock market, you know, <laughs> I'm gonna tell it like it is. <laughs> Commercial multifamily is gonna be it's more stable, mm -hmm. way better. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now when, and when I say way better, it's because there's there's other factors that comes with commercial multifamily things mm -hmm. that um things that you could take advantage of, taxes, stuff like that, cost segregation, depreciation, right? A bank will lend you money to invest in a building, but a bank will not lend you money to invest in the stock market. Mm -hmm. Why? Stock market too risky. You could lose your money. So mm -hmm. let's talk about what you just said though. So, um, but the dividend um, with, with the commercial multifamily, it could range <clears throat> your average cash on cash and, and, and to be specific everyone, when I say cash on cash, what that is that that's what is it that you're making off of your money every single quarter right every quarter what you're making off of that money for us for you taking the time out of your schedule mm -hmm. to let us hold a hundred thousand dollars right so if we have an average cash on cash they say keep it around say six percent then if the if the annual for year one is six percent six percent of a hundred thousand is what sixty grand yep so i'll for have that to look year, at my calculator <laughs> so so for year one if coc is six percent mm -hmm. and that and, and everyone that's going to be relating it to your money sitting in the bank I think that's the best one take your money place it in the bank how much you get every single year it's going to be about 0 0.01 i would tell you take that money out of the bank 
invested into a commercial deal where you can at least get five, six, seven, eight percent year one on a deal. Okay. Year two, it's going to be a little more. Year three more, year four more, year five more. And then when they disposition out, when they sell the property, then you'll get your capital back. And you also get whatever proceeds from that sale, you will also get that back. So you you could double, you actually could double your money within three to five years. I was on a deal. Which is a jackpot, really. It, it, it makes it, it makes good sense to me and you, right? Yes. Hope yes. it makes good sense to everybody else. <laughs> now, but um, um, I was on a team. We owned the property in Augusta, Georgia, 104 units. We acquired the asset, executed our plan within, with less than one year. Plan was executed, property sold, and we more than doubled all of our investors' money within less than a year. Now that's that's good, which brings up another question because I'm sure a lot of people are going to know when you purchase this property. When you purchase property, how do you pick the property, and how are you able to increase the income that uh, that uh, investor receives from the property? Let's talk so, money. Okay, so how do you pick the property? Mm -hmm. You know that's going to be a long conversation. <laughs> but there's a you know. Um, I can't speak for other investors. Mm -hmm. I can only speak for the way I do things and the way I teach things in my mentorship program and the way my team operate. Okay. Okay. We have, we have, um, numbers. I'm going, we have, uh, man, I can't believe I'm, metrics. There we go. There are metrics that we follow. There are metrics that we follow for the city. There are metrics that we follow for the neighborhood. Those metrics must be met, okay? And and when it comes to uh, 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 finding a property, and it, as long as that property meet, as long as the 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 neighborhood and the city meet that meet those metrics, that's a thumbs up. Mm -hmm. We're going to go for the property. Underwrite the property now. Now we get the financials, which is the rent roll and the trailing 12. We get that from the broker or the seller. <clears throat> we sit down, we underwrite the property. There are metrics, again, that we're going to be looking for, which is what's the IRR? Internal rate of return. What's the equity, right? What's the equity multiple? What's mm -hmm. that one? Is it equity multiple? E, right, right. EM, mm -hmm. right? And what's the COC? The cash. average COC, right? Yeah. So as That's long cash as return. Correct. As long as we meet each and every one of those metrics, that's where we're going to submit the LOI. This mm -hmm. is the purchase price that we're we're going with. Blah blah blah. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, so so that is how I pick my property. Mm -hmm. I just don't I you know, I just don't go out there and pick a market. No, uh, no, we have uh, uh, my team and I and in my mentorship program, we have, I follow those strict rules and that's what we go by. Okay. Uh, and so then there's a lot of markets I won't go into at all. And then that too brings up the topic of value add because when you purchase a property, your intention and your goal is to get these returns that you speak of. So, um, Explain you, to the you people. You did ask me a question about that too, and and and, and I totally missed it about the value. <laughs> and how, how we how we um, yes yes so yes the value to the property. yes so yeah. yeah let's talk about that right now. So when you purchase the property, they meet these metrics, and now you have to do the uh, add value to the property in order to ensure right. these returns. So Correct. so do tell. Okay, so um, I've learned a lot during this process of what type of value add to add to certain properties? You don't want to do, you know, um, 
and, and, and you have to, I'm going to tell you, you have to look at people's culture. You have to look at, you know, people, you know, what is it that they want, don't want, they like, dislike. So you may not put a dishwasher. You may be looking at this 200 unit complex over here and it's in a particular uh, neighborhood, but you know, don't put dishwashers over there because they don't use them. Mm -hmm. It's just a cultural thing. They're not going to use the dishwashers. Mm -hmm. But over here, you put the dishwashers over there. They're going to use them because they love it. They, they don't want to wash dishes. You know, they, you know, put, yo, man, put in a dishwasher. So you have to weigh it out. There's certain ways you can improve. There's certain things that um, some investors look for, such as are the rents below market? Can we push the rents? Okay. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so there was a property that there was a property that uh the rents were 866. That was the average. But we were able to push the rents to 950. See that? Mm -hmm. There there was an apartment who um they didn't have they didn't institute rubs, which is a, a nothing but utility reimbursement. Okay. Okay. That, okay. That's all it is. So, so we, we don't need to get too technical at. Utilities reimbursements, everyone. That's what rubs is. Utility reimbursement. You're getting your money back. They didn't have it. But now you go in and you implement it. Do you see how you bring in, you're increasing the value? Uh -huh. You're increasing the value. You, 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 you're, you're, you're doing, you're implementing rubs. You're doing renovation. You, the, Which the means cabinets. that the people will pay more for the property. Right. Exactly. And also, but you got to also look at the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Make sure the neighborhood could support that because you don't want to go into a neighborhood that may be less than 40,000. They may be making like 30,000. You're going to go in and, and, and put in two, three, four hundred dollars worth of, and you're not going to get your return on that. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so you, um, so what you will look at is, okay, renovation. Can we push rents off renovation? And then, you know, uh, um, that's that's why you know even in um even in a downturn you should still raise your rents even if it's by one dollar and I was taught that from my mentor you should or every year you should raise your rent even if it's he said even if it's just one dollar uh huh you should raise that rent now when you do that that's another phrase is called false appreciation right mm -hmm. so so that's what when you compare what we do what you and i do mm -hmm. and compare that to the stock market there's no comparison it's better you get there's better no returns on real estate Correct. at least from our perspective because we're real estate people <laughs> yeah which makes sense so and then too you get to control the income that you receive from it based on yeah. the type of investment. So it's safe to say that when you look for deals, you're looking for properties that have been undervalued. And these are landlords who have maybe neglected the property, didn't really keep up with oh. the, the returns or just who haven't decided to do the, the, uh, the remodeling. Right. So you the find property, those and. Yeah. The property is just in some sort of distress, right? Yeah. And then at that point, they're just ready to sell for who knows what reason. And then that's when you're like, okay, let's write it, you know, underwrite yeah. it for you, see what the returns are. Returns and then are. you make a decision based off that. And right. then two, um, I had another question and it just slipped my mind. The, uh, the returns. Okay. And then is it when you meet a certain threshold that you, uh, as far as dollar amount, is that when you decide to sell the property again? Or do you hold it for a specific amount of years? And then once you meet that that deadline for the years, that's when you decide to sell. And then that's when everyone gets the lump sum. Well, listen, you you don't only make money on the sale. You make and money yes, on the that, buy. That's, you, you're going to make money. A passive investor is going to make money throughout that transaction. Mm hmm because I consider, not, some may not, but I do, if I get a dividend for $800 every quarter, I'm not making money. Mm -hmm. And I know and I know I'm getting my capital back. Mm -hmm. I, I made money. Mm -hmm. So, so, but to answer your question, you're going to make money 
dependent on the investment and dependent on high structure, dependent on the property, because all properties are not value add. Some properties are stabilized. You could go in and you cash flow on day one, mm -hmm. right? So you go, some properties you cash flow day one, you, you, you may get a dividend check the following month. Or if they set it up where you get a dividend check the next quarter, okay, or that quarter. Or if it's a value add play, they may say we're going to hold all dividends for, for two quarters, then on the third quarter, we're going to go ahead and start giving out dividends, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what that's what happens. So so when so every quarter, every month, you're going to get some sort of cash back for just for you being the person who lend us your money. Okay. That's what that that's what that COC. Okay. But then you also going to get not just your cash back, not just as, as we say, not just that dividend, not just your equity back, but you're also getting back a portion of the proceeds mm -hmm. from the sale. You're getting back some of that too. So that's why when you hear someone say we're going to 2x your money, that means you're putting in a hundred, we're going to give you back 200. If someone said we're going to 2x your money, mm -hmm. right? You're getting part of that proceeds, right? Along with your cash on cash every single quarter or however it was structured, and right along with that. Sounds good. Sounds good. We covered a lot of information today. So uh, let the people know who that are that are listening or watching. Tell them how to find you and uh, website information, et cetera. Well, sure. You can find me on LinkedIn at Daryl Murphy Sr., um, and I'm also a member of the GOB Network of Apartment Investors. You can find me through um, through Jacqueline, right? You can reach out to her. Um, we do have, is, if it's okay if I mention the mastermind. Go ahead. Okay. Um, every Tuesday at 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, we have a commercial multifamily masterminds. We meet, it's usually around 50, the, I think the minimum I've had is around 50 uh, members and, and and sometimes it could get larger. But people, this is where we, we actually do deals. You look at them, we bring the underwrite, the raw material, you can ask questions, you could, you, you could critique it. We helping these investors, the new investors and everything. So if you really want, listen, if you want to take action, I mean, take action. I, I'm not talking about sitting on the sidelines. If you really, really, really want to take action and get into the game, come to the commercial multifamily masterminds because we have every Tuesday, we're going to be presenting an underwrite. So the, the, the commercial mastermind is, is really it. And, you know, I'm, I'm one of You'll the- You'll find I'm, me in I'm the also, group. I'll be yep, there. And, exactly. <laughs> and, and, uh, and we are affiliated with the GOB and I am- one of the founding members of the GOP. All right. So there you have it. So there are multiple ways to get in contact with Daryl Murphy or myself. So if you like this video, hit like, subscribe on both mine and Daryl's. Uh, we both have YouTube channels. And then uh, you can find yours under your name, right? Daryl Murphy. Daryl Murphy Sr. And, and Jacqueline, would you, would you, you can share my email, Daryl at MurphyBainerGroup.com. You can share my email with everyone who want to get in contact with there you have it so thank you again for joining me on another episode and uh i'm pretty sure me and daryl talk again because uh we meet every tuesday all right so you guys take care and we'll talk to you again soon bye <laughs>